All right, guys, welcome to the Chief Life Podcast. I'm Matthias Turner, joined today by PJ Nessler on, uh, we've got you on Skype. So PJ, thank you for, having, for coming. Thank you very much for having me. So, I mean, to give you a little bit more of an introduction, um, I don't really know your actual title, but I know that you work for XPT. You're kind of in charge of making sure that the program actually gets organized and sent out and uh, in, in charge of running programs. Is that correct for XPT? Yeah, I'm the director of performance for XPT. So okay. my, my job is really managing the uh, creating the education curriculum and then kind of doing all the back end programming and everything, as well as teaching the uh, the educational curriculum that we, we now run in our certification programs. Yeah, and I mean, like to, I, I guess from an outsider perspective, someone watching XPT from afar, um, like, I mean, we've got some mutual friends, things like Brian McKenzie uh, is one person that we've seen kind of go in a lot and come out and say things about it. But from afar, I've never really understood exactly what it is. Can you kind of give, I guess, the listeners a, a lowdown on exactly what is XPT and what are you guys trying to achieve? Yeah, absolutely. So the way we describe XPT is it's a, a performance lifestyle mm-hmm. uh, that was invented by Gabby Reese and Laird Hamilton over kind of the course of their athletic careers. And really, more towards the tail end of their career now where they're trying to manage being parents running multiple businesses, uh, still, you know, Laird still being a competitive athlete, uh, managing, still trying to stay fit and healthy, um, kind of as they're in their, their middle age. So it developed into this kind of performance lifestyle. And really the, what we tell people is our main goal with XPT is we are trying to help people become the most resilient and versatile human beings possible. Mm. And that's really what Laird is all about and what Gabby's all about is is finding different ways to stress the body, to stress the mind, to put yourself in different situations, to get outside your comfort zone so that you develop resilience to all of those types of uh, situations and, and just uh, kind of taking a different approach to fitness and health. Um, and the reason we, you know, XPT stands for extreme performance training. Okay. Really, people hear that and they think extreme means like Laird surfing 50 foot waves and performance. <laughs> Means like you've got to be a top athlete, but really we define extreme performance as just <clears throat> operating at your highest possible capacity at whatever your task is. So that could be extreme performance in your your job or mm-hmm. in a presentation or you know being a, a father or a mother, whatever extreme performance is, you know, maybe it's a recreational sport, uh, but that's what we define extreme performance as. And we want to help people uh, again, we want to help them perform at the highest possible level and also be as versatile and resilient as possible. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's really cool. I think mean, like from from our background, like we, we help out people with nutrition. It's the same thing. It's like really the foundations are always going to be the same, whether you're doing it for performance, whether you're doing it just to be better in day-to-day life. Like the foundations of nutrition are always going to be the same thing. Um, is there like some basic principles that you guys stick to? Like, hey, this is how we need to be to, to be able to progress forward. Well, our, yeah, so our pillars are breathe, move, recover. Yep. Um, but really, I mean, the foundation behind what we do is so simple. It's really based on restoring the, the fundamental abilities that we were born with and that we've lost throughout our lives due mm-hmm. to modern society, sedentary workplaces, you know, sitting at a desk from the time we were five years old in school. Um, you know, we've screwed up our posture, our movement abilities, our breathing abilities, uh, we don't stress our bodies anymore in terms of like temperatures because we we have now out we've our technology and our um, society has has uh, has evolved a lot faster than our physiology. Yeah. So our physiology can't necessarily keep up. So that's really what what um, our whole program. If you stripped it all down, that's really what it comes down to is restoring some of these f- fundamental capabilities. Um, and kind of identifying what those major buckets are that are going to have the biggest impact on people's health, performance, and longevity. And mm-hmm. like you mentioned, nutrition, sleep, breathing, movement. Mm-hmm. You know, if you don't have those major buckets, then uh, that's kind of what we're hoping to do is is help people create this holistic lifestyle uh, system or program or whatever based around those principles. Uh, and, uh, you know, for me personally, it's almost taking it – it's almost taking it back to the roots because uh, I think as a as a society we've we've gotten into this like biohacking, super charging like so what's this kind of unique supplement plant thing and it, <laughs> ultimately that stuff's really cool if you're operating in the most extreme levels of performance. Yeah, 
99.9% of the population of the world, that stuff's really not going to make a difference because they don't have those foundations set. So that's kind of what we're about is like, let's strip it back down. Let's restore those foundations and then let you go explore. If you're super into nutrition, then go down that rabbit hole, Mm -hmm. but don't go down the nutrition rabbit hole without some really good, like, uh, nutrition principles yeah. and don't just go down the nutrition rabbit hole and then forget about the breathing and the movement. Cause that's what we do a lot is we find our specialty or the thing we're into and then we neglect those other major buckets Certainly. and we do the fact that we, uh, that we're neglecting them cause we're like, well, I'm, you know, my nutrition is so on point or my exercise is so on point that I don't have to worry about my sleep or my breathing cause I work out every day yeah. and you going to pay the price for that at some point yeah we actually like it it pretty much we changed our whole business plan due to it because we literally like created meal plans to start with and people would come to us and we're like well why aren't they getting the results that we we're getting what's going wrong and we realized like hey there's other things in life that you really need to nestle in on like you need to make sure that they're sleeping right that their mindset's in the right place that they're breathing correctly they're hydrating like all of these things come into play and so we we developed our seven pillars of health which is a lot of the things that we've already been talking about which is cool um what I'd like to do is really quickly, we'll take a, a quick step back in time and actually ask you about yourself, PJ. Where did you come into this? Like, how, what brought you to XPT originally? Like, I know there's a, a big backstory before now. So, can you kind of give us a little bit of a rundown on yourself and we'll dive back into XPT from there? Yeah. So, my background is really in sports performance. Uh, I, I got started in this, in this industry uh, because I was an athlete and I, I was always into fitness. And then when I was in college playing football, I worked with a strength and conditioning coach and I was like, this is what I want to do for my life. Mm. Um, so that's what got me into this, this field. So I was all about, uh, sports performance and strength and conditioning. So I worked in the college setting for a couple of years and then I started working in the private setting where I was training high school athletes, college athletes, pro athletes from all different sports. Um, and I kind of just built myself up through that, uh, community in these different private facilities. Uh, I started working in management where my job was, not only to train the athletes, but also to manage the coaches and trainers who were in these facilities. Uh, and that's what kind of, that was probably about six years ago. Uh, yeah, six years ago. And that's where it's really took me more into the education realm because for me as a coach or a trainer, I was always seeking systems and, you know, I, I was trying to, trying to learn to get to the, I was so curious and I just wanted to learn. I want to be at the highest level. And everywhere I went, I was trying to find a system of like, how do you get athletes faster? Or how do you do it strong? You know, I wanted steps to follow, but nowhere I went had that kind of stuff in place. Everything was just like kind of people just doing stuff. Yeah. So what I did is from an early point, I just started creating those systems. I said, if, if no one else is doing it, I'm just going to start doing it for myself. And then I started kind of putting systems together. And then I started running internship programs where I was teaching those systems to interns. And I just kept evolving that and then I was teaching coaches for one facility and then I was managing three facilities where I was managing you know creating systems for a whole bunch of stuff and I really kind of got uh just by um by default I kind of got thrown into the education side of things and a lot of my job was creating these systems and teaching them to people and you know I, I was trying to expedite the process of you graduate college you've never trained an athlete in your life how do I get you to where my current knowledge base is with six years of doing this, but get you there in two years versus six years of me troubleshooting. So, yeah. um, that's what I ended up doing for a while. And I, I loved it. I love teaching coaches and, and working with people who are passionate and want to learn and then seeing them go implement that stuff and have an impact. So I actually quit about a year and a half to uh, about two years ago. I quit, um, the facilities I was working at to start my own business. Mm. Uh, just didn't like the way things were going from a management perspective. And I really wanted to focus on the, the education side of things. So I started a really an online business that was geared towards um, mentorship and trainer education. Yeah. Uh, and I built that for about eight, eight or nine months. And then I got a call from um, one of the investors for XPT. And they said, you know, Brian McKenzie had just left the company. Mm-hmm. And they needed a performance guy to kind of take all of this stuff, cool stuff they've been doing and actually turn it into a system that can be taught to coaches and trainers because at that point XPT was just a bunch of events that people came out and spent three days with Laird and Gabby and Brian and they took them through some really cool stuff, but there wasn't, there wasn't the, the science it's behind it. There was, mm. Yeah. There was no structure on how to teach it to people. So then people would leave and say, 
man, that was a life changing experience. But now I'm going back to New York. How do I continue to do this? Mm -hmm. um, and it just worked out perfect. I mean, that was exactly what I was doing for my company at the time. So um, they were obviously going to be doing it on a much bigger scale and, mm -hmm. and a bigger platform. And, you know, I went to up to Laird and Gabby's house and I met them and went through the XPT stuff. And I was just like, man, these, these are the people I need to be around. And, and this is a definitely a movement that I want to be a part of. So I've been working with them for a year, a little over a year now, almost a year and a half. Um, and that was really my job was to develop this certification program, read through all the research and figure out what we're doing that's actually validated research and maybe what we're doing that we could be doing better. Yep. Uh, and then create this curriculum so that we can go. My goal is really to create a network of certified professionals so that as the demand continues to build for people who want to, you know, let's say we were doing a workshop in Australia and we got 25 people who say, I, I need to do that breathing. I, I, you know, this is going to change my life. Well, now after doing a certification there, I can say, hey, we've got 20 certified tr uh, coaches or trainers in your area. Yeah. So that's really what, what kind of my job and passion is. And I still train at throughout the course of that, um, when I was working more on the education side, I started training a lot of, uh, pro athletes in the NFL, NHL and, and UFC. Mm -hmm. And really my, my real passion is training MMA fighters. Um, so I still train a couple of, of MMA fighters here and there. Uh, but that's really the two major things I was doing the past couple of years was one was full force into combat sports training. And the other side was, uh, was um, the education stuff. And so like, I mean, for you having to make the choice to shut down your business compared to working with the XPT guys, like obviously surrounding yourself with um, incredible people is always a good idea because obviously they're going to lift you up and bring you to higher, higher standard. Um, was that kind of a hard choice to make? Meaning to shut down your business? Uh, it was, yeah, it was a really, it was a really hard decision to make. And at first I didn't have to shut down my business. Okay. I just had to shut down some parts of it. Mm. Um, but it was a really hard decision because really, because I had been working for a lot of company. I mean, I spent the, the first eight years of my career, I spent working for people who I was treated unfairly. I was disrespected. I wasn't taught anything. You know, I was just a, a sponge that was seeking information and looking to learn and nobody was spending the time to teach me. Teaches you what uh, not to do, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I learned a ton. I mean, it, it helped me to become a better boss for sure because I, I learned a lot of what not to do. Um, but then when it got to the point where I was the regional director running a few of these facilities, it was like everybody was coming to me. The owner was coming to me for marketing and business ideas. The coaches were coming for, to me for, for the training. And I was just like, for a long time, I felt like I was having no personal growth and I was spending all my time with other people. And what, you know, when I was introduced to Laird and Gabby and the investors and I realized really quickly that like, you know, I, I firmly believe you should never be the smartest person in the room. Mm. And when I first went up and hung out with these people, I was like, I don't have a single thing to say. Here. I feel so inadequate that I don't feel like I can contribute to the conversation. And it made me really insecure and uncomfortable. But I was like, that's where I need to be. You know, I, I believe in getting outside your comfort zone. That's where you grow. So I could sit back here and be a big fish in a small pond and feel really important because everybody's coming to me. Or I could jump out and be a small fish in this massive pond, but continue to grow and develop. And uh, that, that's kind of the leap of faith that I took. And, and I'm really glad I did because I've learned, I, I can't even tell you how much I've learned in the past year and a half working with XPT and just being around some of the amazing people that are around this company and uh, that are the people that are attracted to this company and this lifestyle. Um, it's, it's been really, really rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely incredible. Um, I, I guess like that, the whole specter of putting yourself around, uh, people and really raising yourself up, would you say like over the last year and a half that you've been with them, that your knowledge is just like exploded? Absolutely. And, and it's finally, I think I've become much more of an expert in certain areas because my challenge when, again, when I was running these facilities, people were coming to me for business, for marketing, for entrepreneurship. Like I, there were so many areas I was trying to learn that I felt like I was getting better at all of them, but only a little bit mm. where now there's people who do all of that. So my job is to be the expert in breathing in hot and cold exposures 
in pool training. So all I do is focus on that. So yeah, okay. the amount of knowledge, I didn't know much about breathing when I started with XPT. I was actually worried to take the job because I was like, I don't know if I'm the guy for this role. You know, there's people out there that study this stuff that are way more versed. You know, my, I'm really good at speed and explosive training for fighters and NFL guys. I don't know anything about this breathing stuff. Um, you know, I had one breathing coach. I knew a little bit about breathing I had been doing, but it was very new to me. But because it's so, I'm so focused in that, I mean, I've spent a year and a half reading. I've probably read nine books on breathing. I've been to four certification or educational courses. I've met with the world's leading experts in, in breathing and breath work. So because I've immersed myself so much in only a few categories, um, I feel like it has expedited the learning curve for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's insane. I mean, it's something that we've been diving a lot more into recently as well as breathing and breath work. And we've, we've been lucky enough to uh, interview people like Patrick McCown um, as well yep. um, as a few other breath coaches, like a few Wim Hof coaches and stuff like that. And it's it's kind of interesting. There's a whole heap of different methods, but a lot of it comes back to the, the bare basics like, hey, breathe through your nose. Like that's the, that's the starting point. Make sure you're breathing through your nose. That's the That's the really basic point. Yeah, absolutely. And Patrick is phenomenal. I mean, he was, his course was one of the first ones I went to. I read his book mm -hmm. and then I went out to London to his course, which is actually where I met Luke. Um, Luke Wills, yeah. Uh, yeah, our mutual friend. So I went to his course and he's actually now our breathing advisor for XPT. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have him on our advisory board and he helped us uh, put together a lot of the background behind our certification program. Um, and then I met with some Wim Hof instructors and it is so simple, you know, when you, when you break it down. That's why I love the Wim Hof method. I think there's so much power to it. Yeah. But I don't think it's the best first step for a lot of people because it doesn't teach the foundations and it almost reinforces the bad patterns that they have because it's so focused on kind of this one thing. Um, but ultimately, if it gets people to do 10 minutes of focused breathing a day, I think it's better than not doing it. And, yeah. and we'll, you know, let's just get people doing breath work and then hopefully they'll come to some X XPT coaches and we'll be able to better assess, correct, dysfunctional patterns, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's super incredible. So, I mean, to dive a little deeper into the the three, so breathe, move, and recover. <clears throat> um, like, what what are you trying to achieve when someone comes in, just as uh, as a participant to come in to do the course? Um, so, I mean, you said you've got the multiple levels as a level to come in to be an actual trainer. Whereas, if someone comes in just to participate, what's the difference between the two? Yeah, so we have we have two tracks. One is very consumer driven, and that's really experiential. Like, mm -hmm. we just want to feel it we want them to to do the breath work to uh, feel the sensations that happen when we go through these different patterns uh, we want them to feel the ice bath and the saunas and the pool training and it's really about like being really deeply immersed into the stuff and the, the hope is that they're gonna leave wanting more yeah so you know we want to teach them some stuff I mean we, we give them if you come to a, a four-hour workshop we're gonna give you a little bit of the why behind what we're doing and then we're gonna give you some takeaways like well, we're going to do a whole bunch of breathing, but I'm going to give you two things I want you to go home and, you know, actually implement into your life. Mm -hmm. And then again, the hope is that they're going to want to come back and learn more. They're going to want to find a coach near them to really go deeper into one of those categories that we expose them to. But that's really what it's about. It's really experiential and we want them to just be immersed into the XPT lifestyle and find the spots that they connect with. You know, maybe they come to it and they're just like, yeah, the, oh, the breathing was cool. The ice bath thing sucks, but I really like the pool training and I have a pool at my house. So I'd love to, you know, maybe I take out one of my gym days and I start doing a, a pool day and that'll help me, you know, for whatever it is. So it's, it's challenging because the system is so holistic that it's challenging to like, what is the one thing we do really well or focus on, mm -hmm. but it's also great because when people do come and experience it, there's so many pieces like people leave our, you know, our two and a half day experiences and they're like, this changed my life. This is completely, we, I got so far out of my comfort zone, you know, from a mindset standpoint, even if it, that's the only thing they get, um, it's so massive. And then it, it can be like, Hey, I'm going to take this and apply it to my life. Or I get people who reach out to me on Instagram and they're like, Oh yeah, I remember that one thing that we did on the beach during that work you told me and it, I've implemented it into all my stuff and it's completely changed the way I've been training. I'm like, wow, that was just something I said off the top of my head on, I went down a tangent, but that's <laughs> took away. Um, so that's really, really experiential. Mm -hmm. And then, and a little educational, 
the the coach and certificate certified coach track is all educational this yeah. is for fitness professionals you have to be a certified personal trainer or strength and conditioning coach just to take our course because mm-hmm. um, we're not going to teach you how to do that this is like the next level of, of things to add on yeah um, and then that's really like you have to be able to really deeply understand the why behind what we're doing and be able to assess and prescribe all of these different methods for different people so you know if you came and I and you were just a, a consumer then I could kind of help you with what you liked about it but if you went home to, to you know you went back to, to Brisbane and and uh, you were like I don't really know where to start because we can't necessarily write everybody a training program when they leave so then you could go find a coach and that coach can say okay well based on your current breathing mechanics and your respiratory you know um, your co2 tolerance and these things here's the breathing protocol we're going to do and then based on you know kind of what you do and what your goals are here's the movement training we're going to do and they can help to like plug all those pieces in because again it, it's a lot of it's really challenging because it, it's not you know we say it, it's a performance lifestyle it's not a system yeah it's not like come to you know that's the difference i think between like wim hof and xpt mm-hmm. the wim hof it is like 30 breaths 30 to 50 breaths breath hold three rounds like that's it. Yeah. Versus, you know, and then ice bath and, and, and mindset. Again, I'm not saying anything negative on Wim Hof. No, 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 no. Yeah. Love the Wim Hof method. Uh, but it, it's a very much a here's how you do it. Mm-hmm. Whereas XPT is very much like we want to give these coaches and trainers the principles behind all of this and then give them the power to create their own breathing methods, uh, to create their own programs where they implement breathing and movement and, and ice baths. And, you know, it can become – if you looked at 10 different programs, they can be completely different, but they yeah. all still follow yeah. the principles of XPT. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. And so something you keep touching on is the the pool movement. So getting in the pool and doing exercise, what, what sort of stuff are you doing when you're in the pool? It's not just straight swimming, right? No, the pool is really cool. You know, it's, <clears throat> it's one of the areas that I think it's very unique to XPT. Um, if, for people who are just looking for kind of general fitness, I think it's awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, people look at it and they're like, well, what, what parameters are you improving for athletes? And the reality is like my athletes who are UFC fighters, we don't pool train that often. Yeah. We use it for recovery modality. Uh, but we still get, we still do pool training where we can like take advantage of physical, you know, neuromuscular recovery, but also get some, um, energy system adaptations and, mm-hmm. uh, but the, the reason I think the pool stuff is so cool, number one, is it allows you to move in, so in a lot of ways that maybe you can't move. So mm-hmm. it's great for people who are injured or maybe obese or elderly uh, because, the, the you know, obviously the, um, the pressure. Pulse. Yeah. Yeah, it allows you – it allows people to go through some really – because we use weights in the pool. So it's yeah. – we do some loaded ballistic movements. Um, we do some different swimming with weights. We have a lot of unique exercises. But – one, it really allows you to move in some ways that you can't move on land. Uh, two, it provides the mindset side of it is really massive because mm-hmm. you're in this new environment where people are really stressed out. Uh, as soon as you start holding your breath underwater, people don't know how to relax. So like I would say the biggest benefit people get from doing the pool training, at least at first, is all psychological. Yeah, And it's really hard to quantify. So it's we can't sit back and say – here's the research on this thing, but anecdotally, you know, and and obviously you got to take anecdotes with a grain of salt, but anecdotally, the people that we work with, those are the breakthroughs that they have. And I mean, for example, my UFC fighters, one of the problems one of my guys has is he goes so hard all the time. He attacks everything with a hundred percent and he gasses out halfway through the second round Mm -hmm. because he doesn't know how to manage his energy and regulate and relax. You can't do that in the pool. If you attack the pool exercises, you pass out really quickly. You can't finish it. So it's almost created this self-limiting environment where he started having these realizations in the pool and it started carrying over to the way he fought. That's and awesome. I was like, that was never something I intended to do with him. <laughs> but I started realizing like there's, you know, if for me, it was, I think I'm a performance coach. I'm a mm-hmm. science guy. Mm-hmm. So... I'm quick to, I'm very skeptical and I'm quick to excuse things that don't have research and all that. And just like we all are, we like to be skeptical, especially if something starts getting popular and then we're like, well, actually that's not really that good. And I think one of the things that XPT helped me with is to open my mind up and and realize that there's 
a lot of really cool stuff out there that hasn't been studied yet. Um, and there's a lot of things that are really hard to quantify. And, and while I still think if you're working with the most elite athletes, you've got to, you've got to spend your, your training hours in the, the things that are going to make the biggest impact, uh, yeah. because you're only looking for marginal improvement. But again, 99.9% .9 of the population is not an elite athlete no. and there's a lot of other benefit they can get. So the pool stuff is really cool. And I, and I, uh, I hope it starts to catch on a lot more because I think people have a lot of fun doing it and it just provides a new way for people to exercise and it can, it can be added on. You know, I'm not saying that you should stop weight training. I mean, I, I'm in the gym four days, four or five days a week. Yeah. That's my personal, that's how I, I am. Cause that's my background. That's mm -hmm. what I like to do. But on Saturdays and Sundays, I don't go to the gym, but I still like to do something. So it's great to go jump in the pool and get a, an hour pool workout where I get a bunch of benefit, my body feels good, I'm not putting extra mileage on my joints, and uh, and I get outside with a bunch of friends and try some new stuff, So and and really challenge ourselves mentally, which is, I think one of the other, sorry, without going you know, two hours down this tangent, one of the other big things I realized is the pool provides an opportunity for us to, to find people's mental wall really, really easily and yeah. safe. Yeah. So, you know, physically for, for a, a tough guy like you or a, one of my fighters, like there's no way I can put them in a situation physically where they're going to be like, I can't do this because for me to get them to that point, I would have to be putting them at so much risk. I would have to put them through a, a three day long military style boot camp for them to break down like that. Mm. Or I put them in the pool, I get their heart rate up and I say, carry this dumbbell underwater there and back without coming up and breathing. And they've run into that mental obstacle halfway through and they have to use positive psychology, relaxation, all of these techniques that we know help us get through obstacles and adversity, but they have to use those to accomplish the task. And if they get into negative thoughts and stuff, they start to fail and we can do it in such a, um, a safe environment because really the only thing that they're running into is this huge buildup in CO2 that's making them start to panic and freak out. Uh, so it's a really cool thing there too, again, where I didn't see the benefit of it until I started implementing it myself and with my fighters. And I was like, okay, there's another really, really cool thing that we're getting from this. Yeah, it's unreal. When I was actually with Luke over in Mallorca, <clears throat> we did some underwater running just with uh, some rocks, like just picked them up off the ground. And it's crazy what it does. Like like you're saying, to your mind, it really just plays with you. Like at one time I ran maybe 10 meters I'm like, okay, well that's my standard. Like I need to get to 10 meters every time. And so you dive down like three or four meters, grab this rock and you're like, Oh, I didn't get 10 meters this time. Like what happened? And it's like the CO2 build up. You're like, Oh, you're getting frustrated. And then you're like, yeah, every time you go under, you're like, Oh, I'm out of air before you even start. So it was really quite cool. Have you ever heard of a guy called uh, Andy Stump? Andy Stump. He's no. an ex Navy SEAL. Uh, like he used to run the buds for Navy SEALs and he's like, you can always tell like right before someone's about to pass in, out in the water and to be honest, a lot of people don't ever go to that point. He's like, you'll see like the last little ball, like sort of <laughs> bubbles pop out and like a little bit of a shake before someone happens, before it happens. He's like, even with the Navy SEALs on like their very last chance to actually get into the SEALs, it's, it's, um, it's kind of like not many people will go to that point of complete failure in the water. And it's, it takes like a, a incredible amount of mind strength to be able to do that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've only had, I've only had a couple of people who've even gotten close to that and they were UFC fighters and that that's why they're UFC fighters. Um, now there's ways to trick your physiology to do that. If you, if you scrub the CO2 out, you do like Wim Hof style breathing. Mm -hmm. um, that's why it's really dangerous because yeah. you don't get that trigger to breathe and people will pass out. Um, we've never had anybody pass out at XPT, but we have had people pass out at Laird's pool before when they were with Wim and they were doing that breathing before they went oh, in wow. and a bunch of them knocking out. So they realized that they probably shouldn't be doing that and it could be really dangerous. So we don't teach people to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've had like one fighter who finished what he was doing and then came up and then afterwards I, he was like, looks like he was about to go out, but didn't pass out because you, that buildup of CO2 is so extreme and we have... Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the really cool things about being submerged in the pool with weights and being in a freezing cold ice bath is you have so many evolutionary processes that are that are systems in your body that are just telling you to get the hell out of that situation that it's like people don't know how to deal with that stuff. You know, yeah. I mean, you 
if you've ever done a, a 32 degree ice bath, I had my breathing coach just recently came into an ice bath at my house and she taught me everything about breathing and down regulation and controlling the mind with the breath and all this stuff. She got into my ice bath and the first thing she did was start to hyperventilate and turn and look right at me like, what do I do? What do I do? Because her brain just was completely wiped. You know, she, everything she knows was all out the window because her brain was just overriding everything and telling her, get out, get out, get out, get out. <laughs> you know, she gets that panic. So I think that's a really cool thing is we can teach people that you've got these safety mechanisms that are in there, but they're very sensitive. They're designed to keep you from being stupid mm. and keep you alive, but they're, they're hypersensitive. So, you know, it's just like our, our GTOs and stuff that are designed to help us, our muscle spindles that are over, over cautious so that we don't throw my arm out of the socket. Snap it every time you throw a ball. Yeah. Yeah. If we train them the right way, then I can actually throw a lot more powerfully because I have those power capabilities. It's just my muscle spindles are slowing me down so that I didn't rip my arm out of the socket. So I think same thing goes for the way our psychology is wired as well. There's a lot of stuff that, um, we just don't give it the credit for how powerful it is. Mm. And then we can start to learn to override that. I think it transcends. I mean, that's one of the things with the ice baths. Like when you can learn to use your breathing and your mind to control that emotional and physiological response, I know me personally, that has transcended ice baths into traffic, into uh, my claustrophobia when I'm doing an MRI or when I'm on an airplane, like these areas where I get massively angry or anxious or something and I'm actually able to use the same exact skills I learned in that ice bath and implement them in this thing and I can tell myself you can control this because I'm nowhere I'm not having a response anywhere near what it was like when I got in the ice bath for the first time yeah, so if incredible. I can control that then I can definitely control this little bit of anger that's rising up because I'm in LA traffic <laughs> I mean the other side of that I, I would assume you guys have to deal with fear quite a lot right like people who have a fear of water of holding their breath like not only uh, anxiety around, like like you said, hopping into an MRI machine or something, but actual like stress of water or stress of ice or cold. Like, is that something you guys have to deal with a lot? Yeah, every single person. I mean, everybody has a fear of those things. There's probably been less than ten people that we that I've personally worked with that didn't have those kind of major fears, and that's because they were either. Ill- Actually, most of them were elite military operators who okay. have overcome that because they've been through Navy SEAL uh, dive school and they've been in these extreme cold environments. So they don't necessarily have that fear. They still have the physiological responses to that stuff, mm-hmm. uh, but fear has been overwired. Um, but yeah, every single person, I mean, those, again, those are evolutionary things. We, we as, as a species are, are sca- like wired to be afraid of being submerged underwater mm. um it, i bet you a bunch of our ancestors thousands of years ago w- walked into the ocean and drowned and then like all right we need to create some things Can't do that, that anymore are, yeah <laughs> as soon as we put our face underwater people are going to freak out and get the hell out of there so that we don't risk you know these guys doing this stuff anymore so it's definitely a th- and then being cold you know the mm. cold and the pain the sensation pain, yeah with, people don't understand how to deal with pain you know pain is pain can be like so overwhelming for people. And, and one of the things we teach is like, that's just a sensation. Mm. There's nothing happening. You know, that pain you're having in your ankle right now is when you get out of this ice bath, your ankle is not going to be, it's not no, like someone's actually sawing it. There's no physical damage being done, but you're still having these sensations of pain. So can we learn how to cope with that and how to deal with that and how to mitigate that? Um, and again, those are major things that will transcend as well. But yeah, fear, fear is the underlying thing behind all of it. I mean, I was afraid to do the pool stuff. Yeah. I still don't like the pool, to be honest with you. Like, I do it because I don't like it. And and that was a thing for me. I, I think with being with Laird, Laird's kind of whole theory in life is is don't be a liability. Mm. You know, he wants to be as versatile as possible. And, and But being a liability means you don't have versatility. So if you're a guy who goes to the gym and you train every single day, but all you do is strength train, and then you and your buddies are like, hey, we're going to go do this 5K. And you're like, oh, I can't do that. I'm super fit, but I can't run a 5K because I have no endurance. Like, you're a liability now. Yeah. Or you're, you're such a, you're so, jo- so jacked can't touch up. You, back. you can't go rock climbing because you can't move. Again, now you're a liability. Or you're a yogi and you're super flexible and bendy, but you're so weak you can't pick up a bag of groceries. Again, you're a liability. So mm-hmm. I think 
for me now, the other thing that's carried over into my life is now when I, when I have something that I feel that fear, I embrace it. Yeah. So I'm awesome. scared to death of heights. So when I have an opportunity to go, you know, I was in Hawaii and we were, we were hiking. We came to this huge waterfall. It was probably 35, 40 feet off the water. Didn't really know what was at the bottom. And one of my buddies was like, we can jump off this. I've done it before. He's like, you want to? And in my head, everything was like, no, no don't no, do it. No. It was looking for the excuses. And anytime I feel my brain trying to, to reason my way out of something, that's my signal of like, yeah, I need to do it. Yeah. Um, and that's like for me in the ice bath. Every time I get into the ice bath, my brain goes, you don't have to stay in here for five minutes. Like realistically, like no one else is here. Plus, like you already did this thing earlier. So two minutes will be fine. And because my brain starts rationalizing like that, that's why I make myself stay in for the five minutes every time. Because I think over time, that's going to create mental resilience that's going to be far beyond anything I've ever had before. Mm, yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's something that I use a lot when I'm coaching people uh, to some CrossFit coaching. And so people are like, oh, I'm just really not good at this. I shouldn't be doing it like this, 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 and give you every excuse. It's like, it probably means you should be doing it more. Like, let's go. Come on, on your bike. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's usually the way. Um, like, unless there's an injury or something that's literally holding you back from doing it, then obviously it's like, hey, put my safety hat on and I'll look after you. But otherwise, right. if it's just that you're bitching out, I'm sorry, I'm going to call it's you a out. There's a limitation here. Yeah. And that's what. So when I had the first time I had a bunch of my fighters show up to do some XPT stuff at my house, uh, we did some pool training, we did some breathing, and I had a girl, one of my jiu-jitsu athletes, and she pulled me aside and she said, hey, I really want to do the breathing in the ice bath, but I don't want to do the pool. Mm. And I said, well, why? What's going on? She told me when she was young, she almost drowned, and she hasn't been able to go into a pool or ocean since then. Yeah. This happened when she was like five or six, and she's now 20, 26. Mm -hmm. And I said... The, then I, the pool is the one you need the most. But I'm going to meet you where you're at. You don't have to do what they're doing. So what I did with her is like she hadn't even submerged her face in water for like 10 years. And I said, all I want you to do is put on the mask. While these guys are doing this swimming, all this stuff, I want you to just put your face underwater and, and walk. And she literally put her face underwater. She's standing on the bottom of the pool. She's not swimming. Yeah. Put her face underwater and took like three steps. And all I did is had her keep building up, try to get mm -hmm. further, try to get further. By the end of our hour of pool training, she had walked. My pool is pretty small. It's probably uh, probably like eight to ten meters long. Okay. She had walked uh, – yeah, maybe – yeah, probably like eight meters. She had walked from one end to the other with her face underwater. Took it up a few times to take a breath but like continued walking. By the end of that day – that's all she had done. By the end of that day, she had the most – her, her sense of achievement was mm. significantly more than anybody else in that yeah, group. And another area where I was just like, this is the power of some of these things. Like when you can find people's comfort zone, you can find the limits of their comfort zone and then help them safely get past that. They can have massive, massive breakthroughs that carry into a lot of things. And again, really hard to quantify. So I'm not going to sit back and say that she's going to go perform better in jujitsu because of that. But I'm also not going to say she's not going to perform better in jujitsu in life in yeah, exactly there's a lot of there's a lot of power to that we are uh, we when we we're over in europe we did some work with um emma gage from swim Mod, and she was saying that she'll get people who are so scared of water that her first session with them will literally just be in the shower like hey we're going to put your whole head under the water while there's while it's running we're just going to breathe like just to show you that it's not a fearful thing like you can get under there and then from there it's like the same thing just blowing some bubbles and getting you in the in the water just to say like it's just getting your body used to it right and overcoming that fear yeah yeah and it's crazy and, and a lot of times we find these kind of areas and we take them for granted and it's you know that's why i think it was cool for me to to feel that fear with xbt because we tell ourselves we're getting out of our comfort zone right like I'm like, oh man, I, I crushed this workout yesterday. I did intervals on the assault bike and I was like almost going to throw up. Like I get out of my comfort zone all the time. But the reality is that's my comfort zone. You know, yeah, I've, exactly. been, I've been in the gym since I was 12 years old. So even though that's challenging for me and I'm pushing myself, it's not outside my comfort zone because I'm comfortable in the gym and I know my limits and I know where I can push past. Go grab some dumbbells and put me at the bottom of a 12 foot pool. I found my the edge of my comfort zone really quickly there, and I to actually feel that fear and that panic and that anxiety that like newbies sometimes feel when they come into the gym. Mm. Um, I think it it makes you a better coach too because you can yeah certainly. you can 
with people on, on a lot of different levels. And, and, uh, again, that's why now I'm, I'm like looking for the things that take me out of my comfort zone. I'm planning on going skydiving soon. Yes. I've been at like the plague because <laughs> I'm <laughs> the heights. So I was like, every time people say they go skydiving, they're like, Oh yeah, that sounds cool. I want to do that sometime. Well, but I can't go that day. I'm going to be out of town. <laughs> <laughs> I just won't be around. Um, you should definitely touch up with, uh, Andy Stumpf then cause he's an instructor for, for uh, skydiving as well. He'll take you Where's out. He he's, I think he was in San Diego, but I think he's now in Montana because he moved out there because he's really into bow hunting. But I know he gets up to, like, he goes kind of to California and OC a bit, I think, for work still. So, yeah. Awesome. I'll have to connect with him. We, I worked with a few guys who are former pararescue, and they were saying they would come and do some jumps with me. I was like, if there's anybody to take you skydiving, it's it's a you want former, <laughs> former pararescue man. Who, exactly. Who, 10,000 jumps in their career in military operations. Yeah. Yeah. It would uh, probably be, you'd at least feel safe, hopefully, or safer. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, getting someone into an ice path, like to start with, it might not be the worst thing or it might be the worst thing depending on where their head's at and they might be thinking, okay, I'll jump in for 10 seconds. Um, where does the science lie for, hey, this is the benefit. You need to stay in for this long or you need to do it this regularly um, for it to actually be a benefit to you. From a so there's two kind of levels we look at it. From a psychology standpoint, we usually try to start people at about 30 seconds mm -hmm. because if you can get through that first 30 seconds, that's really where that massive stress response comes. And if you can override that, I think that's where a lot of the psychological payoff is. And then that's usually where people can start to get comfortable and calm and and kind of practice those techniques. From a physiological standpoint, it's really hard to give minimum effective dose because the research on it is all over the place. Yeah. So. There's studies that show benefits to this parameter, but those ones are done at 50 degrees for 30 minutes, four days a week. And then there's other studies that showed benefits to something else, but those are done at 38 degrees uh, for seven minutes, seven days a week. So there's yeah. like the protocols are all over, but really yeah. what it kind of looks like right now for a recovery benefit, we tell people you probably want to get it. Really the way I look at it is it, exposure always comes down to temperature and duration. Mm -hmm. And those are kind of inversely related. If it's really, really cold, you don't have to stay in as long. Okay. The warmer it is, the longer you probably have to stay in to get the benefit. Yeah. Um, so that's why we go really cold. We go sub below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, usually somewhere like right around zero degrees Celsius is what ours are. Mm -hmm. Again, so that we can stay in for a shorter amount of time. And then we stay in for usually about three to five minutes and we'll do multiple rounds. And it looks like the research I was reading a meta analysis the other day, and they recommended base. This was all about athletes and recovery, uh, but they recommended that you get a total of more than five minutes at total time. So some of the okay. protocols were like three minutes multiple times. Some of them were five or six minutes, but it looked like the minimum to get a benefit for recovery was about five minutes. Yeah, and that's that's one study that said that, but that's the recommendations we're currently making, uh, and then. If you're looking for like overall health and physiological benefit, the more habitual it is, the better. Mm -hmm. So a couple times a week. Uh, but on the flip side of that, if you're looking for like a recovery benefit, you're going to actually start to have a diminishing return if you do it too often. Yeah. Okay. So if you're an elite athlete and you do an ice bath every single day at the end of training, eventually in a couple of weeks, it's just like exercise. It's not going to have as much of an effect on you. Your body's going to start to adapt to that. Now those adaptations can be positive for health or longevity. Mm -hmm. That's kind of re the emerging research is showing. Um, but we don't know yet a lot of that, but from a recovery standpoint, you're probably going to not get as much, um, benefit from it. So like, for example, my athletes, they'll do it like once a week yep. and we usually do it after our hard sparring session. Um, so that way we're, you know, one of the things that we talk about and from Dr. Andy Galpin, who's one of our advisors, yeah. he always says you're either optimizing or adapting. Yes. So you got to figure out like when we're using an ice bath to optimize performance. So if we want to recover from a really hard session so that I can perform tomorrow, mm -hmm. then we can use the ice bath. But when you use that, it can also blunt some of the signaling, some of the adaptation from that training. So if, if my goal is to, uh, to build strength or hypertrophy, for example, then I actually don't want to use an no, ice bath. Exactly. Yeah. Because now I'm going to be optimizing instead of adapting when I actually want that stress on the body. So that's kind of how we use it. I know it's the, that's why we go so in depth into it and yeah. the sort of 
question because there's so many people ask all the time. They, you know, it's like if someone said, Hey, what kind of diet should I be on? Like, How long is a piece of string? Yeah. Yeah. It depends on like what your current diet is, what you like to eat, what your goals are, what your training is. So that's the same thing that goes for ice baths and saunas. But because it's this new thing, people are like, how long should I do it for? Or how mm. often? Yeah. And there's really so many variables. So that's kind of what we're trying to teach. And again, the challenge is with nutrition and exercise, at least there's a lot of Studies. research. Yeah. So you can make like a pretty good recommendation. <laughs> like, hey, when it comes to caffeine, it's been studied extensively for, you know, there's there's 20,000 studies that are all finding similar results. So we can make some pretty good re- uh some pretty, we can come to some pretty good conclusions. Yeah, exactly. Ice baths is like, there's a couple thousand studies, but their protocols are all over the place. The populations are all over the place. So it's like really hard to make our, our best judgment. So that's kind of what we try to teach is like, here's what the current research is showing. Um, and here's some of the principles that we have come up with, but I guarantee you some of the stuff's going to be wrong. You know, and I come out first day of our XBT certification. I say, some of the stuff I'm going to teach you here today I will be wrong about the stance we're taking at XPT is that we are not going to put our flag in the ground and say, this is how it needs to be done. Yeah. We are going to evolve as this stuff comes out and we're, we're going to be the first ones that come up on the platform and say, Hey, remember all that stuff I told you guys about ice baths? Turns out five minutes is not the right amount or it turns out we were doing it too cold. It actually needs to be 50 degrees. We don't know yet. So yeah. we're making kind of our best guess on the research but I think absolutes in anything that when it comes to kind of fitness and exercise in general or recovery, still it can't really be an absolute yet because there is so many different things that are happening and the the research that's going into it and like Andy Galpin's big on it, right? Like he he always wants to prove something wrong. He's like, hey, I'm going to find that. I'm going to find it wrong and that's going to then get found wrong by someone else and that's what's awesome um, right. without the whole, I guess, evolution of it and that's why it is an evolution, which is really cool. Um, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. How about on the side of brown fat? Like, is there, have you seen much studies around the production, body's production of brown fat with cold baths or cold uh, Yeah, so there's a bunch of stuff on, on kind of uh, increasing brown fat um, because it, you know, for, for some of your listeners that brown fat is basically, you can, you can actually brown some of the white fat. So the white adipose tissue is like our normal fat and it becomes more mitochondria. It it has more mitochondria in it. So it becomes more dense, Mm -hmm. um, which is why it turns brown and then it becomes more metabolically active, uh, can be good for like controlling obesity and some other stuff. The looks like some of the, most of the studies I've seen though, they were actually wearing like cold packs. So, you know, again, that's why it's, it's tough because when it comes to cryotherapy or, you know, the term cryotherapy really covers any type of cold exposure Mm. because someone wore like a cold, you know, they almost look like a weight vest, but it's it's actually works in their body. Yeah. Because someone wore that for four hours, are they going to get the same adaptation from sitting in an ice bath for five minutes? We don't know. Mm. Um, There are some studies showing that stuff in ice baths too, uh, but that's one of the potential benefits that we talk about. And and again, I think, the uh, we just found out that adults even have brown, brown fat. fat yeah exactly it's only recent so like the benefits of it and like all that stuff is is so new because you know a couple of years ago i don't know exactly when we found that out but it was recent yeah um you know we, doctors scientists we didn't even think we had it no it wasn't so, a thing it was only something that kids had and then they found out like i think it was actually through uh europeans like who did a lot of kind of cold adoption that they found it yeah, a lot of good research comes from from um, kind of Eastern Europe, yeah. Finland, Scandinavia. Like those are the countries that are using this stuff all the time. So that's where a lot of this research comes from. And they do a really good job with some of the stuff that's coming out. Um, but again, it's like it's some of the challenges there is like they're studying people who've been doing this six days a week for their entire, their life. entire life. Yeah, exactly. It's like, well, exactly. is that something they've evolved to do as a species? Like, as, you know, their parents did it, their grandparents did it. Is that same benefit going to happen to the the Americans in Arizona that are doing it twice a week? Mm-hmm. Again, we don't know. So it, it's it's challenging because it's really hard to get people to do something that sucks, like sitting in an ice bath, when you're like, well, it could be really good for you. <laughs> um, but it's also really cool, you know, because it's cool to keep being on the forefront of learning as this stuff comes out. Yeah, I, and to be honest, like I always feel better after an ice bath or a cold yeah, plunge or anything like you feel better you feel fresher your your joints feel better even if you don't have inflammation you feel better like yeah i think there's yeah. nothing no 
no bad things to come from it to him as well. And that's what Laird always says. You know, Laird's like, there's science right now, but like it's not that conclusive. But mm. if, if the research comes out tomorrow and says that, hey, that stuff you guys thought about ice baths, it's really not doing that. Am I going to stop ice bath? No. Nope. Me yeah. and my friends are still going to do it three days a week because we feel better. Mm. So he's like, I don't give a shit what the research says. <laughs> you know, like my job is to give a shit about the research uh, and to find as much of it as possible. But from Laird's standpoint, he's like, I'm going to explore what makes me feel better, what makes me move better, what makes me perform better uh, in my life as a father, as a husband, as a big wave surfer. Like, whatever those things are, I'm going to do them. And, you know, I don't give a crap if some researcher from halfway across the world tells me that it's not working. Mm. Uh, You know, I think there's always a line to walk there because it's very easy to go down that anecdotal path of like, I know what's right for my body. And, you know, that's why the scientific method exists because – we can't, you're not controlling any variables there. Um, but like you said, the main reason I do the ice bath all the time is because I feel awesome afterwards. Mm, yeah, exactly. It just sucks a lot when I'm in there. So I work on my, my mindset doing stuff that sucks. And then the other part is like, I just feel good afterwards. So yeah, you know, I just, I keep doing it. And so for someone, say, say someone can't actually get along to your, your program XPT when you guys come out for, um, in November, and they want to do some ice baths, but they don't want to be in there for like, they're finding they're in there for 20 to 30 seconds. How do they progress themselves to be in the ice bath longer? So what I tell people is it's, it's always about a do- It's always about dosing. Mm-hmm. Uh, jumping into a 33 degree ice bath for three minutes is probably not the first step most people should take. <laughs> yeah. We throw people right into that, but that's because we have experienced coaches there that are there to help them and guide them through. Yeah. You know, it's just exercise. If you've been sitting on your butt on the couch for 10 years, you probably shouldn't jump up and try to go run a marathon. Yeah. You know, you got to walk before you can start to run. So what I tell people is start off with a cold shower, start to expose yourself to cold. So take your normal shower and then at the end, spend 30 seconds in the coldest water it can go. And then once you can kind of handle that, you're, it's never going to feel great. Like there's no. not a, we're like, well, when do I know to move to an ice bath? Like it doesn't get easier. You just learn how to deal with it. Yeah. So it's like, you know, when I get into a cold shower, I'm not like, wow, this is so warm. It's still cold. It still sucks. But you get yourself used to doing that. And again, that depends on kind of where you are. I know in Southern California, our water's not that cold. Mm. So shower in Southern California is not really that challenging. Yeah. Uh, unless it's in the winter. And our winter is probably kind of similar to your guys' winter. Especially in Queensland. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So then I tell people like, okay, well then get in a cold bath and dump a couple bags of ice. You know, it doesn't have to be 35 degrees. If you put the water cold and you dump a few bags of ice, it's probably going to come out to be like 60, 65. It's still pretty cold for people. I mean, people go jump in the ocean and they're like, it's freezing. That water is like 62 degrees. Yeah, exactly. So it's pretty jump in and sit in there and then, you know, try to stay in and, and get comfortable for a few minutes. If you can do that, for five minutes or so, then you can add more ice and you can get the temperature down. You can either add more duration or more, uh, or lower temperature Yeah, yeah, or both. So you kind of build the duration up. Another reason we like to go so cold is because it's a lot easier to do three minutes in a freezing ice bath than it is to do 25 or 30 minutes. Like I don't care how warm it is. 30 minutes sitting in an ice bath is, is almost hell. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Some of these research studies, they have like people sitting in like a 55 degree ice bath for an hour. Oh. And I'm like, I don't care what the benefits are. No one's going to do that. Yeah. You know, besides these people who are probably getting paid for this study or some poor college kids they recu- recruited to do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> what hell will you go through for 20 bucks? So, so we just say, dose it, uh, do- start off with a lower dose. Yeah. Go a little bit warmer, get yourself comfortable, or go through it. Uh, and then go a little colder, dump another bag of ice the next time and then, or stay a little longer and keep dosing that. Um, and then when you're, if you're ready to take a big leap, find someone who can help guide you, you know, Mm. don't do it on your own. Don't fill up your, your backyard garbage can with 25 bags of ice and try to climb in it and just stay in there for 10 minutes because you know, you want just like anything else. If you're going to really try to push it, 
go find an XPT coach nearby you who can help you or someone who's been through it. And, uh, you know, we can obviously expedite the learning process and, and help you get there because that's, that's what we do. Yeah, definitely. Um, something we didn't dive into, and I know we're running out of time, but uh, it was saunas. And you guys do touch on saunas a bit. Um, what, what are you kind of looking for with the saunas? Is it basically just an all-around recovery? Uh, yeah, so a lot of the sauna stuff coming out right now is really looking like super promising for disease populations. Mm. So that's a lot of the research. From a recovery standpoint, saunas are are not actually like the best. No. Um, they can be okay for recovery if you stay in for like a short amount of time and you get kind of a relaxation effect. But if you use it the way we do where we stay in until it's pretty stressful, mm -hmm. uh, then that's where you can get some adaptations. We tell people like – if you want to get the benefit from a sauna outside of just relaxing, you've got to actually stay in there long enough to stress your body. Yeah. Um, cause if I'm just sitting in a sauna for 10 minutes and I'm nice and relaxed, like that's good if you're just trying to relax, but you're not going to get the benefit. Um, but there's a whole bunch of stuff coming out, some research on, on helping control obesity and diet and blood glucose for diabetics. Yeah. Um, people with like, uh, inflammatory diseases, cardiovascular disease, um, a whole bunch of different stuff. So, and again, this is promising. Um, not, not, uh, it's not like there's 50 studies that are like, Oh, this is really good for this, but there's yeah. a lot of all the stuff that's coming out is looking popular is looking promising. Obviously we've got some correlation studies that are popular. Uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick likes to talk about them all the time about the correlation of, uh, frequency of sauna use and lowered risk of basically dying from any cause. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, correlation doesn't really mean much, you know, correlation does not mean causation. So yeah. it's cool. It's really, all this stuff is cool and promising, but it needs to be studied a lot further for us to really understand it. Um, so what, when, when we prescribe really what we use the sauna for mostly is to go back and forth between the ice. So yeah, we do the contrast. Yeah. Or it gets you, we get really, really hot and we get really, really cold. And we try to take advantage of the benefits of extreme heat, extreme cold. Um, and at the minimum, it helps people do more rounds in the ice. Mm, okay. Yeah, that's very interesting. So when you guys come out, like, what do you do? How do you bring all this stuff? Where you just rent a space that's got a pool, it's got, got tubs and got a sauna? Yeah, that's the challenge for us is the logistics. So yeah. we have to find a place that, has some of it. Uh, most likely, they've got to have some kind of heat source. Usually, if we're going to do ice bath, um, doesn't have to be a sauna. We've we've done steam rooms, we've done hot tubs. Those ones are not as ideal because they don't heat your body, your it's core body temperature as much. Yeah. Uh, but it's better than nothing. So uh, we usually find a place that has some saunas or has a heat source and has a pool that you know most of the pools are not deep enough to do some of our really cool deep water stuff, but our level one cert is all shallow water exercises anyway. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, um, awesome. So we find a place that has a pool where we can bring some dumbbells and then the breathing is easy and then uh, that's what we do. So we found a, a really nice location in Noosa where we're going to be doing our certification and one of our workshops um, at Noosa Springs, I think it is. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we're tr possibly locking down a facility. We're, we're still working with some friends in Brisbane um, who have kind of usually what we do is we find people who live in that area who've been to XBT or they know what we need and they can help us kind of find Tandle some of this. Yeah. And uh, you know, sometimes we'll find a health club where we can do breathing, sauna, ice bath, and then there's a pool nearby and we drive to the pool. Yeah, cool. um, we don't have everything on site, but until we start having a lot of XBT franchises and affiliate facilities that open up and have these things. Uh, that's the challenge for us is finding locations where we can do that stuff. But hopefully we're locking down a few of them in Australia. Uh, so we'll be able to do a handful of different offerings while we're there. Cause this will be our first time down there. We have one XPT certified coach, uh, who's in Noosa, I believe. Okay, cool. Uh, he's been one that helping us bring it down there, but we want to expose, we're going to do some free breathing classes down there. Uh, we're going to do some workshops. We're going to do a whole bunch of different things. So there'll be a lot of opportunity for people to check out XPT on some different levels. That's super rad. So I think you're in Noosa 19th of November onwards uh, for your actual practice, like the dates that you, you're actually doing your things. Yeah, is the 19th is a Sunday? Uh, the 18th is a Sunday, actually. So we actually will be there on the 18th. We're going to do a workshop. So that's for like general consumers. Anybody can come to a workshop. 
Um, we're going to do that on the 18th. And then the 19th through the 21st, that's our certification. So that's going to be the only thing we're doing that's like specifically only for coaches and trainers. You have to be a certified coach or trainer to come to that. Uh, and then on like the 23rd, we'll probably be doing another workshop, either the 23rd or 24th in Brisbane. And then either the 25th or 26th, we'll be trying to do one in Perth. Um, and then I'll probably throw in like a, a free breathing class in some of those locations on one of those days as well. And we'll, uh, those ones are great because we could just, I mean, breathing's easy. We can have 100 people show up and we take them through an hour of some breath work and we give them some takeaway, you know, teach them a few things and give them some takeaway stuff they can implement into their life. That's super cool. Um, and so for people to kind of keep their eyes on it to know when, when, like when it's actually locked in and where the, the potential free breathing clinics will be, like where's the best place to kind of follow along? Best place for everything is xptlife.com yep. or our Instagram, xptlife. Uh, that's where we'll post like the breathing class and stuff. We already have the the certification is already up on, on xptlife.com slash certification. Uh, the workshop in Noosa is already up on our website. Uh, so those are up and can be signed up for already. And actually, I'll, I'll give your listeners my uh, – a discount code for the certification. Unreal. If they use XPT PJ, that'll save them, I think, like 20%. It gives them like $300 off the certification. That's decent. Yeah, that's really good. Um, and then, yeah, we've got a, a couple of workshops, and those will be on the website as well. So everything will be on our website and on our social media. Perfect. Well, dude, uh, we might wrap it there, but thanks so much for your time. Um, it's very, it's super interesting. I could literally talk about this stuff for hours. So I'm, I'm very intrigued to get along to one of the, one of the courses. I think that would be sick. So yeah, I hope to see yeah. you when you're out here. Yeah, this was fun. I'm glad that we had a chance to chat and we'll definitely uh, plan a time to meet up and, and get you involved in one of the things we're doing while we're out there. Yeah, perfect. That sounds super cool. We've got out, we're doing a retreat actually that same weekend. Um, so we're, we're away until the, the night of the 18th. But that's all right. I can uh, always get involved after that. So super keen. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. DJ, thanks so yeah. much. And guys, make sure you check it out. I mean, there's a there's a lot, like there's a reason why a lot of people are looking into these areas. Like it's not just going, um, not getting unnoticed, definitely, because there's so many people who are starting to look into this. And it's cool to see that you guys are really narrowing in on like the breathe, move and recover. Like it's cool to see it kind of all come together and literally be pieced together for you so you guys don't have to go and I guess really look for it yourself. Like, PJ and the crew have already done the work for you. So go along, check it out, see what you guys can get out of it. That'd be awesome. Absolutely. Thank cool. you very much. Thank you. Awesome, dude. Thanks for that.